Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borak Thung Athletes and welcome to the 2080 Throwcast. I am your host, Molchar, and this week we're getting the chills of some folk horror. Next week in the Galaxy's Greatest Comic will be the debut of new strip Thistlebone by T.C. Eglinton and Simon Davis, and we're very much looking forward to uh, to this brand new story. We're going to be talking to them in a second, but uh, it's going to be in Prog 2135, which is out on the 12th of June. Make sure you pick up a copy from all good Thrill Merchant. I've read the first couple of episodes and very much enjoyed them. So uh, it's uh, horror is something that 2000 AD has done quite a bit of over the years, but uh, it's always nice to see new takes and uh, new series. So it is an absolute delight to welcome uh, Tom Eglinton onto the podcast. Hello, how are you doing? And uh, good, thank you. And Simon Davis. Hello. Hello. Right, guys. Um, so uh, we'll talk. We'll come on to talking specifically about Thistlebone in a minute. But I, I, I wanted to explore the kind of ideas behind it, the themes behind it, influences, things like that. Um, Tom, let's start off with you. Tell us a, a little bit about the the, the genesis of of, uh, of Thistlebone and, and and where it's coming from. Because folk horror is uh, a, a, a bit of a buzzy term over the last sort of eighteen months, two years, three years. Mm. Um, you've got things like scar folk, uh, which riffs off a very particular type of nineteen seventies. <laughs> experience yeah. uh, of growing up. Age, golden age of folk horror. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, tell us a little bit of, 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 about how uh, Thistlebone came about and how this fits into that theme. Um, so, well, I think originally it started because both me and Simon were talking about folk horror that we really enjoyed. Mm. Um, and it's just like a very specific kind of uh, type of horror the obvious example is the Wicker Man. That's like kind of the most um, renowned kind of folk horror. So it's got a, a very sort of specific feel to it. It's kind of got, you know, the kind of rural background, uh, often strange folk traditions, uh, weird cults, um, and sort of a, just a kind of feeling of disquiet is often um, goes through a lot of these these kind of things. Um, you know, recently it's, it seems to have been coming back a lot, like... Um, I think like Kill List is a good example of like kind of modern version of folk horror. And um, what else have we got? There's... Um, a fair uh, field in England was... Uh, oh, uh, that was great as well. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, I got... I got. Sorry, Tom, to interrupt. Yeah, but, no, and you got... I, I sort of became quite interested in the folk horror uh, genre through reading uh, Adam Scoville's book about... Uh, folk horror called Hours Dreadful and Things Strange, which is a sort of an overview of this, uh, this sort of strangely uh, um, English uh, sort of, uh, and I think it probably is, I, I suppose it, I suppose British rather than English, but uh, but this sort of thing about the land being integral to uh, almost like uh, something that's reacting to to uh, the humans' involvement, particularly, say, sort of with the onset of uh, Industrial Revolution and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's about the sort of inherent fear that as humans have of of nature and the strangeness that nature can uh, can have. And, uh, and so, so I got sort of quite interested in that, and then that sort of led to the, the sort of the... They call it the unholy trinity of Wicker Man, Blood on Satan's Claw, and Witchfinder General, which uh, which all sort of deal with the you know dark dealings in the sort of heart of the countryside. And what, what's interesting about folk horror is, apart from in those films, Blood on Satan's Claw, with Wicker Man and Witchfinder General, they're not. There's nothing. There's nothing sort of supernatural. There is no monster. It's just humans being monstrous to each other, sort of using using sort of the supernatural god or whatever as a way of being able to do that sort of thing. And I quite liked that as a theme. Yeah, and I think that that was um, a bit of a, a jumping point for Thistlebone, and that we kind of wanted the you, you know those kind of weird traditions uh, and almost like nature 
and people's reaction to nature being being the kind of uh, the nightmarish element uh, rather than something explicitly um, supernatural. So, in 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 terms of of uh, what is horror for you guys what what you know you, you already mentioned the fact that, that, that in this kind of 1970s style horror it, it, it's we who are the monsters more than, more than anything but what are the elements what are the stylistic elements for you that that, that 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 kind of seal the deal on something like folk horror that and that that make it worthy of a uh you know a, a nomenclature of its own uh, i think specifically the the kind of uncanny aspects of nature and the kind of disturbing aspects of nature which is something I really enjoy because it's something I, you know, I spend a lot of time out in nature, out in the woods, and I see nature as, uh, you know, a lot of people see that as as either very sort of um, idyllic, but um, I see it's, it's quite horrible. And you know, there's a there's a hugely savage part to nature, um, which is, which is strange to think about, especially in Britain because we've got such a kind of like, you, you know, it seems so calm and nice, but. Uh, underneath everything, there's this kind of sort of uh, dark side, and I, uh, that's that's sort of uh, the point I think with um, that I love with folk horror, uh, specifically kind of uh, uh, connecting it also with traditions and rituals that are, uh, are kind of hangovers from a different time that we still have. You know, these kind of like mummering and wassailing and um, the Beltane Festival in Edinburgh, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. You know, it's, it's that's that's kind of the part that I enjoy. I mean, on a, slight, on a slight sort of tangent, I mean, it's it's uh, it's quite prevalent uh, at the specifically at the moment with sort of like the, the climate movement and all that sort of stuff. Is about how far removed we seem to have come as a as a species from the very mother that gave birth to us. So it, it's uh, and it, it's that sort of uh, trying to reconnect with it. And just quite how strange and fearful people are about it, or can be about it, because it's you know it's it's a whole it's a whole other world that is going on within our world that we have no control over, particularly or, or know anything about. So I quite like that that sort of strangeness. Mm. And as for as for uh, as for horror, I've been reading a lot of uh, M. R. James yeah. stuff like that, which is not that too is not explicitly sort of horror it's more sort of implied and i and i much prefer that and i think i i think i read a, a thing about him and he was saying that uh, if you if you stretch your arm out to your side and slightly back and then move it forward until you can just about have a sense of your fingers waggling that is where the true horror lies rather than in front of you and and it's completely true, and uh, so you know so that and I think folk horror has a lot of that sort of element because it so much of it is completely unseen and and implied. So uh, so yeah, I much prefer that as a genre rather than I don't know your uh, your body horror and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Do, do you think mm. do you think a, a, a referring back to to things like the 1970s and, and, and even further you know Tom you mentioned uh, some some kind of traditions that have been maintained or revived over over, over the last sort of uh, 100 years. Do you think that's yeah. um that calling back is a result of of things like urbanization that actually for the vast majority of people now um the countryside is something that is far away that is that is almost alien to them. Yeah, and that and that's exactly it, you know, because it's this kind of um, it, it's this kind of paradox that happens that the the more you're kind of uh, concentrated uh, in the city and the safer you make it, you, when you do go into the countryside, it's suddenly much more threatening, and uh, you know, and that and that's the kind of we're trying to sort of tap into those those feelings, those kind of like um, dark feelings of that the countryside is this ancient thing um, that's always been there that's always had an influence on us and that you can't escape that. So you, you kind of, um, I, I think for a lot of people, their experience of the countryside can be, can be quite sort of scary. You know, they, they do see it as the other place. So you can kind of, um, play with that a bit and, and, and kind of use it, especially with the, the, these kind of, uh, strange rituals that, I mean, I love them. I love, I love the fact that that still happens now that, that there's been a kind of pagan, um, revival, um, and so sort of Beltane and Samhain, uh, you know, these have become festivals and we kind of almost 
uh, returning to to some of these uh, some of these ideas. Uh, and I guess what's interesting is that it, so one of the one of the points that um, uh, reference points when I started to, uh, writing Thistleborn was uh, looking into the kind of history of uh, the Green Man and like uh, the Horned God and all these different incarnations of sort of pagan uh, deities. And what's interesting about it is a lot of them uh, have very nuanced, they're very nuanced kind of figures in terms of they're not wholly good um, and they're not wholly bad, but they represent both things. So they're both savage and divine. And um, so, so it's quite an interesting uh, point of, of, of reference for, for this kind of horror. But yeah, before I before I started out on it, there was a uh, just by chance there was a film by Paul Wright called Arcadia that came out. So I went to the cinema to see that, which is a which is a film just made up of all BFI's clips from from whenever Pathé started or BBC started of uh, of sort of rituals around Britain, and he also sort of stuck in stuff that happens now, like sort of. Or, or stuff that happened in the night is like rave culture and just mix it all up just to make this sort of incredibly strange sort of uh, a, a patchwork of of the weirdness of Englishness and Britishness. And I just think that re- works really well because, I mean, sort of sort of have, having clips of people sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of taking part in uh, sort of... Uh, you know, the mummers and st- the Lewis, the swinging of the tar barrels and stuff like that. And you think, geez, that's really peculiar. How did they get to that point? And then switching out to some rave in the middle of some warehouse in Manchester. And you think it's not a million miles away. And it's this curious sort of, uh, I don't know, almost sort of worship of something that isn't present that I found particularly fascinating. There's a, a, a strong element. I, I, I read a very interesting thing just recently about the folk horror revival that it's interesting that it's coming now um, because the last time it was it was really popular was in the, the, the sort of 70s and, and very early 80s. Um, and whether this is uh, an apocalyptic element to, uh, to, to to horror because you, you, you particularly things like, I guess, The Wicker Man, um, you see that kind of disillusion of the self, uh, the destruction of authority, that kind of thing. And they, they linked it to the fear of annihilation um, uh, from nuclear war that, that, that was going on with, with, with the particularly heightened tensions in, in, in the Cold War. And now people are becoming very aware of, of the threat of uh, 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 well, the climate catastrophe. Uh, do, do you think that's an element of it? This, 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 it it's a... a, a I don't know, a, a reaction to mortality and our, our part in the, the kind of wider universe? Yeah, I, in some ways I think it's a, probably more a reaction to technology. Mm. So, so, you know, like um, with the 70s, it was the kind of the fear of the nuclear nuclear age. Now we're in this sort of fear of um, the information age. We're seeing the sort of dark side of that kind of unravel Um and and it tends to be that when people react, you know, what you look back and, and is one sort of way of doing it. Uh, the weird thing with folk horror is you look back and it's kind of got this uneasy feeling to it. So it's not a it's not a nostalgic um, looking back. It's a kind of a it's got a very mixed um, emotional uh, aspect to it. But uh, yeah, I think it's definitely to do especially the it fits nicely with the um environmental catastrophe because i think we realize that we're so disconnected from um the countryside and the land and nature that we need to that we, you know it's one of the ways that we're kind of connecting with it even though it's you know through through horror it's still a, a sort of way of uh, trying to almost kind of explore your feelings towards it if that doesn't sound too pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I do, yeah, I do think it's a, uh, it, the fascinating thing about folk horror is our complete sort of, uh, you know, sort of that, the com- sort of fundamental sort of disconnect between us as a species to, to the land. I mean, on a very basic level is, is the land providing us food? And, uh, you know, my, 
you go into sort of supermarkets and everything and there's there's food from the whole world so the whole concept of harvest is completely lost so you know you expect you know to, the food tomatoes all the year round lettuces and everything like that so we have we have an absolute sort of ignorance of the the, the earth works in a particular way you have your spring you have your summer you have your autumn you have your winter and then it's a cycle whereas now we've just completely ignored that in a in a sort of for instance a food kind of way and uh, and so therefore you know and, and so therefore you know it's inevitable probably spiritually we just pay the price for that because it, it's it's been interesting to watch the revival of folk horror over the last few years. Because it, it certainly took me by surprise, but the way it's manifested itself is, has has been quite unusual. Because um, you've got uh, things like uh, Scar Folk, uh, Richard Little is uh, absolutely fantastic. Well, it started off as a blog uh, and has gone on to uh, uh, to become its own thing. Um, that's very much playing with. Uh, notions of the uncanny and the dangerous, uh, particularly for those of us who, who grew up in the 70s and 80s and who were constantly being terrified by public information warning <laughs> films. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, 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 I still get really nervous around electricity pylons. Like, not, not like I'm, if I'm right up against it, but I, if I see one in the distance, I thought, oh no, and get struck by, uh, you know, get hit by the electricity. So, uh, uh, do, do you think, the, uh, as, as you say, Tom, this, this is a, a reaction to, to technology and then, and also the, the realization that it's going to be nature that will, that will claim us, you know, nature will change and, and, it yeah. is very yeah, likely yeah, it will consume us. Yeah, that's absolutely it. I think, you know, because it's kind of the, uh, it's figuring out where the horror is. And I think the horror is, is that idea that nature is something that's all powerful. Mm. And that's that really bothers people, I think, because <laughs> you don't want to be reminded of that, uh, especially nowadays when, you know, it just seems like uh, we're on top of everything in, in some respects in terms of, you know, living nowadays, you, you live a healthy life, you, you eat well and you have all these sort of benefits, but underneath and behind everything is, is the kind of the, the nature is, is always the master, you know? So it's, so it's kind of a strange, strange aspect. Yeah. I mean, I thought I, uh, I don't know if this is true. Uh, uh, it sounds great, but uh, I, I was, I sort of heard somebody say that uh, we are the only, we see ourselves as the superior species on the planet, the absolute top of the heap. But with that, we are the only ones that could be removed and the, and the earth would be fine. If you removed any of the others, we'd be absolutely in trouble. So, and I, and I quite like that as a, as a sort of uh, a check about, uh, about us getting above our station, about our role in the world. We're just part of it. We aren't it. You see what I mean? Mm. In, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the actual kind of, jumps the scares uh folk horror is is quite different to, to your kind of slasher horror and, and and things like that in that um it, it's playing with certainly you know in the examples that i've seen it's playing with people's minds people's perception of of, of reality is is that something that you wanted to touch on in 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 thistlebone that that um what we what we think to be truth, what we think to be real, is is uh, very much open to interpretation and and manipulation. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, especially with like the kind of idea of the uncanny. Um, visually, there's a lot of stuff that's that's kind of like uh, kind of off-putting, um, but also there was stuff that I was trying to get in that was uh, almost psychological. Just the idea of the things that are most disturbing are, are kind of belief systems so so there's so so avril the main character has to sort of deal with the fact that she's you know got some of these um belief systems from this weird cult that that she uh, that she sort of inherited and and that the the real horror is the kind of disquieting feeling of uh, not knowing what's reality and that you kind of make up reality as well um so yeah so that was part of it yeah, from uh, from the sort of art side of things, uh, it was quite it was quite freeing in the fact that I, you know, when uh, there was a, there was a lot of the imagery which which may or may not be true. So uh, 
So uh, sort of Avril sort of, is, you know, I don't know if it's not really, it's, God, it's not a spoiler or anything, but there's, the, you know, flashbacks and stuff like that and, and the whole misremembering what has happened and sort of, uh, sort of what she perceives that she's seen that may or may not be true and the sizes might be not, true or accurate and uh i quite like that idea of the fact that you know the the thing that terrifies you most is your thoughts about what is terrifying and what is there what is out there ready to get you 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 make up all kinds of uh stories to scare yourself really and uh i quite like that i quite like the way tom tom wrote that so, i like the, i like the way you drew it <laughs> <laughs> get a room <laughs> yeah, come on now. <laughs> oh. Well, let's, let's talk about this one uh, specifically. Um, Tom, uh, g- give us a bit more detail about how Thistlebone uh, came about as a as, as a concept and how you two came to be working together on it. Uh, so originally, um, it just started off with conversation about folk horror, and then we kind of had the idea of maybe uh, pitching a, a folk horror strip. Um, to Matt and sort of seeing how it went. And then I, so I kind of thought up a few ideas. It changed quite a few times, I have to say. It sort of uh, originally, um, yeah, quite a different story. And, and but we kind of worked on it um, to sort of refine it and basically try and make it, um, you know, a bit different from the other folk horrors that are out there. But at the same time, having lots of nods to um, the, the, kind of, the kind of stories that we're familiar with. Um, and yeah, we sort of uh, uh, d- just kind of worked it from there. And, uh, you know, I think we already knew what we both wanted in terms of, uh, especially visually, the kind of stuff that we wanted to in- include, the kind of ingredients of, of, of the sort of folk horror. And, and I really s- tried to tailor that to Simon's artwork because I knew that uh, it's perfect for this sort of thing because it's, it's all about atmosphere. It's all about kind of... Um, those kind of amazing uh, pagan imagery and, and all this sort of stuff. So, and there's no yeah. technology because I'm hopeless at drawing that, which was. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I was I was very pleased that there was so much sort of uh, nature involved in it. I mean, I, one of the sort of books that was had a big impact on me when I was young, and I and I do, I do sort of consider it quite folk horror is Watership Down because it's 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 exactly the same fear of you know these 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 rabbits have to move because of technology and 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 a new housing estate or whatever that's moving in and and so i liked you know i really wanted to get sort of some animals i had this sort of uh, just sort of uh, you know overwhelming thing about having these great big foxes or hares and uh, and stags sort of wandering around the forest so they almost became the forest at night was these moving part. The, the the creatures were the forest moving around. If you see what I mean. So, uh, so yeah, Tom was good at that again. Sorry, Tom. No, no, that's no, good. No, because well, originally I think um, that you sort of mentioned some of the the thing specifically that you'd, you'd mentioned that early on, and so I kind of worked that in, which I guess is the you know that's quite a good way to work where it goes back and forth. Um, I've sort of done that before, and that seems seems to be a good. Uh, yeah, I think we'd actually. I think uh, I think the seed was sown, or where we were. I think we all went. Myself, Tom, Boo, and uh, and uh, a few others. We went to uh, this wood down south near Tom, which is an old yew wood. Yeah. Just wandering around there, and uh, thought, yeah, this would be a pretty a pretty cool thing to do, actually. We all we all had interest in, particularly I know Tom had interest in that sort of stuff anyway, and uh, mm. and me too. So it just seemed like a the perfect solution. I just so it just it's just uh, a pain that it seemed to take uh, so long to do because I think that we were originally this was supposed to be out sort of beginning of the year, but various things happened that sort of put it back and uh, and uh, but I'm glad it's finally finally seeing the light of day mm. so Tom, it, it, this this does feel quite kind of i, I apologize for this term zeitgeisty in in the uh folk horror is about to get a big boost again we've got the film midsummer coming out which looks absolutely amazing um 
And just a just a little while ago, and it, it's an American uh, bit of kind of. Crime drama folk horror was uh, the first series of The Sinner with Bill Pullman as well, which, which does kind of deal with ever so slightly similar setup to, uh, yeah. to Thistle Bone in that you're dealing with 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 uh, with cults. Yeah, and I guess um, I guess uh, True Detective, the first series of that, had mm. had a few shades of kind of, uh, of you know that kind of weird uh, cult like um, folk horror sort of influence yeah it's it's funny i mean i didn't i genuinely didn't uh expect folk horror to be this popular at the moment but it does seem to have suddenly had this quite a big push um you know and we were talking about this uh, originally the project you know a few years back and it, the, there hadn't been much uh then but it seems to be now quite a quite a big kind of theme um so yeah so it's good it's good to actually be part of that yeah i i i that I live in uh, East London, and in Whitechapel, there's quite a famous sort of cinema there called the Genesis, and they had a uh, for a while. It seems to be on a bit of a hiatus at the moment. A folk horror cinema club, and they and they had sort of uh, showings of uh, The Wicker Man and uh, Don't Look Now, even though that wasn't technically folk horror. But they, their Wicker Man was originally a double a double bill release with that. So, and then sort of things like Field in England and blood on satan's claw and uh it's so that you know that sort of was an indication that that uh and you know and the cinema used to be pretty full each time so it was definitely a definitely a sort of uh a critical mass of people you know sort of interested in it so yeah i think it's, i think it's a really interesting sort of subject i mean it is it is uh, there's a, a really fantastic uh, facebook um group called folk horror revival and it, and it, you know, and, and they release sort of, and I think Folk Horror Revival is an umbrella thing where they release various uh, books on writings and stuff about uh, psychogeography and uh, films, music and et cetera. So there is, there is a definite sort of, uh, it's almost like a harking back to sort of, particularly the music, sort of like, a, you know, the 1970s prog and stuff like that. Mm, mm. So there is, there is definitely a... Something in the uh, something in the furrows that is uh, rising up, and uh, and there's a definite sort of interest in it. So, uh, tell us a, a little bit about the central premise of of, of Thistlebone. So it's um, the central premise is really following uh, Avril, who's a woman that's been uh, who was abducted as a child uh, by this bizarre cult and managed to escape, and then twenty years later she returns to the woods where it happened along with the journalist um, to kind of go over um, what happened to her. And, and it's really about the kind of memories that she unravels and then the myths surrounding this entity no, uh, known as Thistlebone. And, and that's the sort of central premise. It's, it's kind of a mixture of folk rituals and horror and madness, and it's all that kind of wrapped up together. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, you know, it's, it's, it is one of those sort of things where you, at, at any, oh, well, certainly I felt when I was doing it, any one time when you're, when you're reading or whatever, you think, oh, yeah, this is happening. And then you think, you suddenly think, well, maybe it isn't like a linear story. Maybe this isn't actually happening. We've only got, you've only got uh, Avril's word for it, that any of this is true. She might be just making the whole thing up and stuff. And I quite liked, uh, I quite like that aspect of it. Yeah, we tried to sort of do, uh, it was quite a lot of ambiguity um, with the story and kind of specifically the, the idea of having someone's memories as the as the kind of lens that you see a lot of the story through. You, you can't tell whether they're being reliable or not and uh, what's come from them and what's come from outside. So uh, that was a big part as well. So I, I want to talk about some of the um, uh, techniques you use visually uh, for for this series because I mean in the past when we've talked about horror it, it's been generally accepted horror is sometimes a very difficult thing to do in comics because if uh, you, you are reliant on the speed at which um, the reader is reading the page so so do um, you know, what technique to, to, to kind of control the way that they are reading it and uh, the way that they, they might react to it well, the, I guess one of the big parts is with, with horror comics specifically is you don't have sound, which is a huge, huge part of horror. Um, if you think about all horror films, you know, uh, 
such a huge part is all to do with sound. So having that removed, it places more of the um, emphasis on the imagery, but also the, the pacing in terms of um, with comics, you can slow people down with uh, how many panels you have on a page and where you're going to show something if it's you know over the page. Um, and there's, there's, so there's sort of various ways to do that. Folk horror is quite good for it because it's a lot of it is to do with atmosphere and kind of those uncanny, disturbing images. So it's it's more about sort of seeping into someone's consciousness uh, rather than giving them the kind of the the jump fright. Um, so yeah, so, so from the script side of things, that's that's uh, where I came from it. Yeah, and so so I uh, I sort of got into the habit with. Uh with comics was sort of when I started Slain was sort of roughing it out, do, doing colour roughs for the whole story. So I, so I wanted to do that with Thistlebone too. And uh, sort of a good way of sort of, I suppose, just instilling menace rather than sort of uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a horror element rather than sort of, you know, blood and guts and all that sort of, because it isn't particularly that sort of story. And... Uh, the the way of doing that was just sort of shifting of the, the sort of palette of the of the pages really. So there's sort of sort of juxtapositions from really bright, sunny, beautiful days where the birds are singing and all that, and then into the heart of the dark woods and sort of just trying to play with that kind of shifting of tone to sort of uh, hopefully create a bit of just a, you know unsettling really rather than. Uh, sort of jump scares and all that sort of thing because that's because that sort of thing is very hard to do unless you you absolutely are sure about which page in it, how the how the the story is going to appear in the comic because you sometimes you can have a reveal page but you just have to make sure that that you know that is the page the last page you turn over onto or something like that but, you know so but luckily we didn't have to particularly worry about that sort of thing because it's not a particularly a jump fest it's just quite a sort of a seeping hopefully a seeping sort of uh terror thing and and uh and threat st- sort of story because you, you uh, simon you've got you've got form with um 2000 ad horror before because you had stone island with oh, uh, yeah. ian uh, ian edgington and that 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 was much more your kind of uh a thriller style uh horror but i I still got a kind of folk horror uh 1970s vibe from it mainly because of the palette you were using yeah yeah and i mean that all that all sort of took place in uh in dartmoor which is a place i particularly love and uh and uh i mean it's an incredible it's incredible i think it's an absolute i think it is a unique sort of uh, ecosystem in the world so i and uh and so I want, you know, I wanted to set something there. So Ian Edgington was was pretty good with that. And so therefore, you know, that all the sort of stories I grew up with, like Hand of the Baskervilles and uh, horror stories like that, they all had a sense of place. And I think place is very important. If you see, if you're sort of reading a book or reading a comic, and you're constantly thinking, well, yeah, this is good, but where where is it happening? And uh, and so sort of a sense of place is. It's very important. So with Stone Island, yeah, I mean, hopefully uh, there was a bit of an uh, there was another isolated feel to that where they were all stuck in this in this ridiculously designed prison that <laughs> for some reason they had. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, but yeah, so there, yeah, so there are elements to that. But I think uh, Stone Island w- was a bit of a bit of a gore fest mm, in the. Mm. Tom, with, with a series like Thistlebone, which is which is ten parts, um, what do you what, what what's, what's your general discipline with pacing on something like this? Because that, by two thousand eighty standards, that's a fairly chunky story. Um, yeah, you know, the has, first part is ten pages as well. Ex- exactly, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how, how how do you kind of uh, moderate your your pacing as you as you go through on something like this? Um, I guess with this, it was really a case of um, I sort of plotted it out a lot more. I, I tend to um, do do you know what uh, the the writer's equivalent to an artist's thumbnails, which is just uh, literally going through the amount of pages I've got and and placing where I need to have the kind of uh, main images or um, you know or or slow the action down or speed it up and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of 
but with this, yeah, I, I sat down and and plotted a bit more carefully because I wanted to make sure the pacing didn't feel rushed at all. Um, because with uh, specifically this type type of thing, you you want to be sort of going slow yet with lots of stuff happening, but but with that feeling that it's it's kind of uh, you know probably more a rural kind of pace, so that you've you've just got this much um, gentler kind of uh, uh, rhythm to it. And with with the characters, what was your uh, intention? Because so, sometimes um, with horror stuff. People can get a little bit tropey. They, they, they you know, uh, the characters are, uh, are essentially have, ca- have characteristics to further the plot to allow them to be taken advantage of yeah, in, so, yeah. in, in, in in some way. Um, which what came first, the the the, the idea of Thistle Bone or the character? Um, a bit of both because uh, there was a sort of main idea of Thistle Bone, and then but specifically. Avril, the main character, really, um, I really wanted to do someone that, that was sort of uh, quite psychologically flawed in that she's, you know, someone that survived something that's horrible and then uh, how that, that uh, effect has, has manifested in their consciousness. So it's, it's that was quite interesting because that's quite, um, uh, that's a nice sort of character to work with. Uh, with the various flaws and someone that's kind of gone with their life and then gone back to this kind of trauma uh, and it kind of how it can unravel you quite quickly. And so, yeah, so that it was, it was a mixture of both. And I tried to avoid uh, with, with other characters having anything too obvious and too tropey. Um, so yeah, that was the main thing. And then there's a, the, there's a character called Hillman who's, who's the leader of a cult. And that was kind of the, the basis for that was, the idea of if you had, you know, a kind of um, a, an eco uh, a commune that had been poisoned by a, a Charles Manson like figure, you know, I was trying to use that idea of what would happen if uh, the equivalent of Charles Manson for the, the for the environmental movement sort of occurred. So uh, that was that was quite a nice challenge to have as well. I mean, you, you've just mentioned somebody that I, I was going to be into the discussion. Uh, Charles Manson kind of uh, is is the uh, the hmm, how to describe him dark shadow. Uh, whenever uh, you're sort of talking about uh, kind of 1970s culture and cults and 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 and, and, mm. th- and things like that. Again, how 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 do you kind of use a, a situation with which we we all feel familiar with you know not not necessarily because we've all been uh, in contact with cults but because we recognize it as a trope from tv how do you bring something fresh to that uh i with that i sort of tried to basically um <laughs> put myself in the mindset of i you know m- make it as plausible as possible so so how would you how would you get to the point that you would do terrible things for your beliefs um and i you know and i actually sort of thought well it's not too far removed to think of specifically the charles manson that's quite an interesting kind of um reference point because he you know i i'd I'd read stuff about him years ago and how he'd just successfully kind of subverted um essentially all these kind of ideas of free love and turn them into something really dark quite quickly um and so i kind of understood a bit of that psychology and 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 I think maybe that's that's quite kind of an interesting time to do it, which is um, this time when we're having kind of ecological crisis, um, but how that can maybe be taken up by the wrong people. And are you thinking about stories beyond the initial? Like I, I don't want to give, sort of give anyone any, any any spoilers, but has the process of doing Thistlebone given you a way to continue the story? Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to see how this goes, and I. Um, but th- there's definitely more because it's quite. Um, uh, there are many sort of different angles you can come at it because it's uh, a big part of it is the location where it's set, the woods, and um, you know it's kind of spread over time as well, which gives a lot of possibilities. So yeah, yeah there's definitely. Uh, yeah, I, no, I think I think there's there's definitely scope to explore or go off on a tangent or continue or whatever really so yeah it's good so because you 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 came on to thistlebone having done a run uh with pat mills on on slain what was that experience like going from that kind of uh, I, I suppose what folk some folk horror is harking back to kind of like the, the mythological uh pagan past to uh to something a bit more contemporary 
Yeah, I mean, I I, I sort of uh, did, I think it was about five, maybe six years on Slain. And uh, I sort of got, you know, got four books done and, and uh, you know, it's hugely enjoyable. And uh, I just thought, you know, that's a good time to to uh, pass it on to somebody else. And uh, But I really loved the, uh, the sort of, uh, just just painting nature really, and uh, you know, with Slain walking through the woods and the countryside and everything, and I just realised, you know, that's that's where my fit is. I mean, with for two thousand, I've, I've sort of drawn quite a lot of stuff for them. Sort of been working for twenty five years this year for them, and uh, you know, most most of the stuff I've done is, you know, I've really enjoyed doing it, but I've never felt, you know, I'm as an artist, a really great fit. So where, when Slane came along, I just thought, well, this is, this is probably nearest, damn it, the best fit I'll have. This is back to not being able to draw technology and all that. And, uh, and so, uh, and so, you know, when we sort of talking to Tom about what, we, what we wanted to do, uh, this seemed like a, a perfect solution, really. It's something we were both really interested in, the sort of the whole genre and uh but also giving us a chance to or me a chance to draw stuff that i really wanted to draw so yeah it's perfect really because there is a uh another element to your involvement in this one in, in that you are a member of a, a a folk horror rock band oh yeah yeah, yeah. fork tale uh, boo cook and me we sort of started doing this project i suppose about uh Three or four years ago, we just started off with doing one one song. I mean, Boo's a massive sort of fan of things like The Wicker Man and and stuff like that. And so we we were just talking about things like that. And he obviously plays in bands. I've played in bands since he was a kid, and I've and I've done the same. And uh, and so we just sort of just went over to his place and uh, sort of sort of recorded one song. And then from that. It, uh, you know, using the sort of folk horror as the umbrella, which really, which really helps with creating, certainly creating music, you know, we sort of literally as sort of uh, thinking, oh, yeah, what well, I want to do a song about, I don't know, the, a U forest, like the one we've just done with Tom or something, which is pro- it's probably he instigated wanting to do a song about that. And then we try and uh, record a, record music, that is sympathetic to that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been quite interesting really. My sort of doing, sort of doing this, for want of a better word, my actual work with Thistlebone and then sort of doing this band with, uh, with Boo is uh, sort of been quite a holistic approach to the whole thing really, which is, which is great. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing for, for the launch of Thistlebone is is setting up a, a Spotify playlist so that people can kind of listen along to, to thematic music to go with the uh, the first double length uh, episode. Um, if people wanted to, to kind of delve into folk horror to, 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 p- uh, to pick out key things that have influenced the series, what are the kind of books and films that should be? I mean, we've, you know, we mentioned some, but what are the kind of books and films that they should be seeking out? Uh, well, certainly for certainly for films, I mean, you would you'd you'd be pretty sort of. Uh, good, I mean, I would imagine most people have seen, particularly two thousand readers have seen The Wicker Man, but uh, but uh, Blood on Satan's Claw is really good. It's a bit wiggy in parts, but I think it's pretty brilliant. And uh, Witchfinder General, which uh, Witchfinder General is an, uh, uh, an interesting film because I really do find it quite incredibly distasteful in parts and uh you know very bad tempered as a film which i suppose was uh completely uh completely planned but i of all of those three i find that the most disturbing and uh but those three are great and then sort of more contemporary the witch is a great film which came yeah out that's a, that's film. a great one yeah the witch uh i saw the ritual quite recently that's pretty good and uh and uh and like you say, uh, what was it? Summer. What? Uh, Midsummer and, and Kill List. Uh, yeah, both. Kill List. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, oh yeah, Midsummer. You know what John Nettles will think about that? God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was in it. Is he not in it? <laughs> Is he? He should be. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah, that's pretty good. And then uh, I don't know, Tom, what you think about music and all that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, uh, Fork Tales, great. The uh, I would, funny enough, I was listening to that when I was when I was writing it, and a lot of the a lot of the soundtracks to those films are all pretty good. Um, and I guess who else would be good? Yeah, Mark Wilkinson's uh, soundtrack to Blood on Satan's Claws, fantastic, mm. absolutely brilliant piece of work. And I was listening to uh, actually, Boo put me in touch with uh, Richard Dawson. His album Peasant is absolutely fantastic. Yes. That's, really? that's the other one. Yeah, that was the other one I was listening to. That, that is great as well, yeah. It's got a very good have you, have you heard that, Mike? No, I haven't, actually. Really good. I mean, it, there's some fantastic songs from the point of view of, uh, I don't know, a sort of soldier in in uh, Civil War and stuff like that. It's really <laughs> amazing. You, you immediately have my attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting that, that earlier on, you know, Field in England kind of came up as, as, as one of the things, one of my favourite films, um, for obvious reasons. But um, mm. uh, just that kind of unsettling nature of, 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 of the whole thing, it, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely adore it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so slightly hallucinatory feel to it, mm. but mm. still you can't be quite certain about what you're watching and what, is this actually happening or is this just somebody just off their heads and and that sort of hysterical sort of thing. I mean, certainly Blood on Satan Claws, Satan's Claws a lot to do with that, about the hysteria, sort of all, almost in a sort of uh, the crucible type way where, you know, people are whipped up to do things that they would normally not do and you don't quite know whether there is absolutely a malevolent power or it's just humans being humans and just trying to assert their power over their over their uh, peers or whatever and there's a good um there's a good audio book uh, version new version of the blood and saints club oh yeah yeah that that works well as as as, as well it's got a great kind of uh, feel to it in terms of folk horror have you heard that uh, mike no no i haven't i, I uh, it's, really, it's really great i mean i think uh, you know mark gatiss is in it and mm. uh, reese shearsmith and mark morris did the adaptation it's fantastic really really mm. Because earlier on, you mentioned M.R. James, and I, personally, I give a shout out to the 1970s adaptations um, that were done of his uh, of his stories, um, which I I, I I watch every Halloween. Um, so I, I watch one every evening while I'm making tea, and um, some of those are just absolutely downright terrifying. Yeah, as part of uh, this folk horror cinema club thing that uh, I used to go to, they had. Uh, they had a double bill of uh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, the Michael Horden adaptation mm. of that. Uh, oh, that's great, yeah. There, there was another one. What was it set on a railway line? God. Oh, yeah, the... Uh, signalman. The, oh, signalman, the signalman, yeah. yeah. The signalman, yeah. And, uh, yeah. But uh, Whistle and I'll Come to You is absolutely terrifying. You know, the you know, Michael Horden's character on the beach and then he turning around and seeing in the distance his figure just relentlessly following him. Mm. And the sheets at the end, you know, it's just, uh, you know, so simple, but it's just, you know, MR James is a really good understanding of what is terrifying and what isn't. So, uh, yeah, I know that, that stuff is amazing. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, comics. There's not, uh, I can't think of many comics, uh, folk horror specifically, but good horror comics. Um, the uh, Junji, Junji Ito is fantastic and occasionally you get some stuff that's kind of folk horror with his tales um, David Hine did a great thing called Strange Embrace which is really good horror and then and actually uh, John Smith's Cradle Grave is one of my favourite horror comics of all time mm. but that's very urban but um, it's yeah uh, really great example of, of horror in comics which is uh uh, a good one. Well, yeah. th th that that neatly brings me around to what I wanted to, to kind of round off with is is talking about Thistlebone in the context of of 2000 AD and and, and what horror we've published in the past. And I, I was very much struck how um, uh, certain elements brought to mind uh, Luke Kirby. Oh, okay. Um, just just that kind of you know the 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 the, the rural is strange, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I guess. I mean. Um... Uh, it just sort of yeah my my influences were, were quite a few and pretty much 2000 AD always kind of <laughs> is always the background um to a lot of my uh, creative output um and specific yeah I think 
Cradle Grey, funnily enough, was a was a reference point for me for. Um, I, I just I, I was trying to think of a rural uh, opposite to the kind of urban uh, story that I was telling, and and that because I think John Smith's great, and that particularly I think is a really strong story. Yeah, the art in that was amazing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I I, I think you know I, I I so you sort of forget that uh, that two towers. I know it's ba- it's predominantly a sci-fi uh, comic, but I think there's always had that horror element to it. And I think this is, I think this is quite a nice fit to the whole, to, you know, to its whole roster really. So, uh, yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty pleased that Matt sort of went for it really. Mm. Okay. Brilliant. Well, like I said, I, I've read the first uh, couple of episodes and absolutely loving it and uh, looking forward to seeing what the reaction from the readers is. Um, but uh, I think we've, we've, we've come to the end of our chat. So uh, guys, Thank you very much for being on the podcast this week. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Yeah, no, it's great. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Well, thanks so much to Simon and Tom for talking about Thistlebone, which debuts next week in the galaxy's greatest comic. Make sure you pick up Prog 2135 for the debut of this brand new series. Well, that's all from the 2080 Thrillcast this week. Earthlings, make sure you tune in in two weeks' time when we bring you more from Tharg's Mighty Organ. Splendid Verth Rig. Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2080online.com. Alert! Alert! Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2000AD on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2000AD online. And follow on Instagram at Insta 2000 AD. Program complete. Shutting down.